I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Maxim Eristavi, who is a Ukrainian journalist and writer. This is the second episode on the channel. So please, if you like this, uh, certainly go back and check our previous conversation and also check that you are subscribed to the channel so you don't miss any of the content. Maxim is the author of Russian Colonialism 101. It is a guidebook and self-described Russian colonialism storyteller in chief. He champions global awareness about the Russian colonial legacy. Edustavi has a two-decade journalism career behind him that includes championing mainstream English language coverage of Eastern Europe by indigenous Voices. He's also the founder of the Volya Hub, the first storytelling hub expanding public awareness about Russian colonialism and is a co-founder of Ukrainian Spaces, a multimedia hub that amplifies Ukrainian voices and decolonizes global Ukrainian conversations. And of course, we will put links to all of these into the description. And I don't know if the book is still available, but if you haven't got a copy of Russian Colonialism one-on-one, -on -one, it is the most fantastic, instructive, and beautifully produced book. Maxim, tell us, is it available? Is there going to be another imprint that people can get their hands on? Yeah, it's absolutely available. It's um, largely still being printed in Ukraine. Um, and so you can order directly from Ukraine to support Ukrainian publishers and Ukrainian book printing and eventually Ukrainian economy. But we also have now um, stock in inside the EU. So if you go to RussianColonialism.net, uh, you can find all the available options to uh, order it and bring it. And also, I always recommend people just to go to your favorite bookstore and demand it for it to be carried there. This is the uh, the best way to advocate on behalf of Ukrainian books in, in, in general. I think that's an excellent idea. There are fortunately quite a few Ukrainian books that are now on bookshelves. Uh, fantastic authors such as Andrei Korkov and others, of course, and more histories in the more serious bookshops. But if they're not stocking this, they are really missing a trick as well. So uh, we'll put the uh, the link in the description. Well, let's dive in because last time we talked about some of uh, the colonial uh, behavior of Russia that people will be aware of, certainly in the Baltics and others. We also talked about Donbass and the extraordinary process of erasing historical memory, uh, resetting and rewriting history. But as I look through your book cover to cover in detail there are many episodes of imperial behavior which i wasn't even aware of let's start with one which people probably won't uh, really um you know have any awareness of and that is the extraordinary um involvement in iran from the years 1911 to 46 again an extended period this particular intervention includes stoking uh ethnic divides, political divides, um, invading under the pretext of protection and a form of extermination, which is ethnic cleansing. Please, could you tell us a bit more about this one? Because it's it's remarkable to hear uh, of this behavior and these tools of Russian imperialism we're familiar with, but being applied in a context we may not be familiar with. I often uh, remind people that even myself, I learn some new things about Russian imperialism and Russian colonialism every day. And there is obviously not everything that is known to me, despite that I've been researching this uh, topic for over a decade now. And Iran and uh, many other chapters that were um, uh, written about the uh, nation's uh, neighboring uh, Russia, um, they were even surprising for me as well. Um, in terms of, you know, in terms of Iran and in terms of other countries, uh, large countries that suffered from Russian imperialist and colonial endeavors, um, we can name, for example, uh, also China, Japan, uh, even some conquests overseas, like, for example, to North America, to Africa. These are really little known chapters uh, of Russian colonialist expansions. And I think for the reason, I mean, A, because of course, uh, Russia worked very hard to erase as much evidence as possible or to rewrite or hijack the narratives as possible. Like for example, in the invasion of Iran, it was all about protecting Russia's interest or protecting Iranian interest. And it was like, uh, once again, a goodwill gesture uh, to intervene and to restore order, which is once again, part of the same playbook 
now Russia has been using everywhere uh, to paint itself as a benevolent power that just comes and fixes the mess that uh, other uh, people cannot cannot do. And but the I think the also funniest part of it is just you know many people do not often associate Russia to be this classic imperialist power on par with you know Brits or Spaniards or um with the uh, English for example and the you know the one of the most popular fallacies there is this uh, overseas colonization um myth that you can only be colonial power if you conquered someone overseas or you went somewhere far and you established colony which in fact in case of Russia does in many cases does not work because Russia was inland expanding including trying to for decades to conquer Iran or you know make it a uh, vassal state for Russia however in the last couple of years i also learned almost literally unknown stories of classic so called classic russian colonization in places like africa and northern america where they did go overseas when they did um establish colonies when they did genocide indigenous nations so far away so in my job i'm just trying to bring back all these facts and all these pieces of information to kind of you know break the myth that russia is unusual imperialist power or unlikely colonial power they did use the same tactics that other colonial power used and they survived through the same means like any other imperial powers did and isn't there another thing that sort of distracts or confuses people which is also perhaps sort of uh, interesting in relation to Russia's future development and that is that something like the British Empire and others you have the rise of the nation state and you have the rise of mercantilism and a lot of the imperial mechanic comes out of the kind of firepower control wealth uh, that's driven by these evolutions in the economy, but you also have this concept of the nation state. You have concept of, as well, you know, national and regional identities. Russia however, never, has never been a nation. It has sprung into existence as an empire. It's always been an empire. And in some senses, when you look at the contiguous land empire, it's conquered territories which themselves never reached that stage of becoming nation states, or at least many of them uh, didn't. If you consider Buratia and Siberia and many territories, um, is this something that endlessly sort of confuses us about seeing this as an imperial uh, project? It it does confuse people a lot, especially if, um, when. Often Russians um, go into this um, imperial mindset mode when they try to portray any criticism that you direct at Russia or Russians, especially in context of the ongoing genocide in Ukraine, as Russophobia or xenophobia or even racism. And sometimes when I talk about Russian colonial crimes, uh, there might be a person, not necessarily Russian, who would say like, oh, the this is all sounds like racism. You cannot, you know, basically talk in general about some uh, culture of imperialism, culture of colonization, because it's it's just racist to towards uh, Russians. And I think there is huge misunderstanding gap, exactly as you pointed out, because well, first of all, being Russian is not a race. I don't think that we can apply um, race dynamic when we talk about the Russian society. And second of all, one of the larger misconceptions that uh, Russian is about ethnicity or it's based on um, uh, some ethnic traits. Russian and being Russian is an imperial identity. Um, Russia is, as a state, as an empire that even carries the name that they stole from Ukrainian um, history. Um, so, of course, there are many people of different ethnic and and even uh, skin color backgrounds within within Russia, many indigenous nations who are still trapped within this empire without any opportunity, even legal one, according to Russian law, to secede or proclaim independence. Many of them suffer disproportionately because they're being drafted 
and shipped to Ukraine to commit genocide in disproportionately high numbers compared to white uh, Russians living somewhere in the um, uh, closer to Moscow. St. Petersburg. So I think this, when you look at the history of how Russian identity formed, what it stands for, it's 100% an imperial identity. So you can, can come from different ethnic backgrounds. You know, some of the Ukrainians helped to shape that in, imperial identity in uh, 17th, 18th century, because Russia imported lots of intellectual power from Kiev, newly colonized back then, Kiev, to help to shape this myth of why Russia is a great, you know, so-called great in power and has the right to colonize and oppress and expand and eventually becoming what it is today, the largest country in the territory. That didn't happen in handshakes and hugs and friendships. It happened through brutal, brutal ways of colonizing and expanding. And does this help to partly explain, I know, again, reality is complex and there can be multiple explanations as to why Vladimir Putin decided that a full-scale war is something he wanted to become part of his legacy of his sort of 20 odd years um, ruling on the throne of uh, Russia. Um, but the idea that Ukraine is emerging or re-emerging as a nation state uh, is re-emerging into the European mainstream and is an inheritor of all those processes, such as the Reformation, the Renaissance, and, and the, the you know, Industrial Revolution, all these other processes. Ukraine is, is re-merging with that, which would put the seal on its attempt to Russify Ukraine once and for all. There'd be no going back. Is that process of um, not just joining the West and NATO and the stuff people fixate on, but actually the emergence of Ukraine as a powerful nation state. This is something he felt he had to nip in the bud. Well, first of all, I want to take a step back and to remind everyone that Putin is just byproduct of the system. And that's exactly what I want to point out in this guidebook as well, to see that through different regimes, different rulers that Russia had, they would use the same, absolutely the same playbook of colonizing and expanding, just because it's a byproduct of how the Russian state exists, why it exists, and the reasons and the means for it to survive are all the same. So if you're a talented uh, leader and you want to become someone prominent within this culture, within this set of values, you become another Putin, you become another Stalin, you become uh, another uh, Tsar or another ruler. So I don't think that it's uh, really helpful, or I think it's quite meaningless to talk about personalities at this point, because today it's Putin, tomorrow it's going to be someone else. And this is one of the biggest uh, mistakes of understanding Russia abroad, that people are so transfixed on personalities when we, in fact, are dealing with a system and with a culture and with a centuries-old uh, history of abuse. So in that regard, um, whoever is there at the top, and once again, going back in the history, you can see that every prominent Russian ruler tried to erase Ukraine. And this is where we come to a question why they're so transfixed on Ukraine. And uh, of course, because of uh, you know very classical reasons, Ukraine is very rich on resources. This is a land that provides agricultural, natural resources for centuries for Moscow. This is where they built, they built their wealth. Um, and also for economic reasons, but also for exactly that I mentioned before, cultural and historical reasons. Because in a way for Moscow to build up this image of great power and why it has um, the excuse to do to colonize, they had to steal more ancient history from Ukraine. And every time Ukraine builds up itself back and tries to assert its own voice, every time Ukrainians trying to speak with their own voice to tell their own story in their own language to the rest of the world, that is an existential threat to Russia because it conflicts the myth. What is Russia? How it became about? And uh, what it stands for, because let's not forget that Moscow was founded as a colonial outpost by Kiev 
in the northern woods that did not belong to Ukrainians in any point. So it was, you know, uh, a sin of colon original colonization that the Kiev Rus was guilty of. And I think once you try to mention it and, um, you know, it's kind of the entire myth of Russian greatness crumbles down. And this is why it's important for them not only to control that part of the Europe, Ukraine, economically, because it brings so much money and it makes so much economic sense, but also it's important to keep mouths of Ukrainians shut, whether by oppression or by physical erasure. And many analysts will look at the conflict and they'll talk about economics, land, they'll talk about NATO, they'll talk about, I would say, fairly rational or rationalizations of that behavior. Even some of them will, will look at the sort of, you know, colonial mechanisms that we're going to discuss in this episode. There is, however, also a mystical element. And I'm interested to hear whether that mystical element actually cuts through your entire research. Does it go back to the pre-revolutionary period as well? That would be the Third Rome, Tretirim, the idea that uh, Russia deserves and is entitled to colonize and conquer other people. Yeah, I think I'm really encouraged once again. Unfortunately, there are not so many uh, Ukrainian authored books and Ukrainian authored uh, sources available that easily. And, and as a Ukrainian author, I face this brutal reality uh, myself when we're struggling to get our book on the, the bookshelves um, because uh, because there is no culture of of uh, uh, profiling Ukrainian authors still. But one of my favorite voices, which is Oksana Zabushka, the most prominent Ukrainian writer of the modernity, she actually spent lots of time writing, including English, and educating people about how this myth of civiliz great, uh, civilizational greatness has been actually shaped by lots of Ukrainian intellectuals a, and uh, that Moscow imported, and how actually the the stance and the cultural legacy and historical legacy of Kiev, as this one of the most developed and most prominent cities uh, in Europe since the dawn of times, how it was just you know grabbed, copied, and exported to Moscow, and all these things about the Third Rome or the uh, civilizational role that this part of Europe has and the continuity between the um, different ancient civilization and how they found a new home in places like Kiev. If you go to the original script and to original sources and you actually read Ukrainians before Moscow even existed, you will see that there um, as the original ideas. So. Once again, of course, Russia for centuries rewriting this history, reclaiming, stealing these narratives. It's very hard for you to go back and trace the original source. But luckily, we have so many Ukrainian voices and researchers and prominent um, uh, intellectuals that are doing exactly like that. Oksana Zabushka or Vira Hiva or other prominent Ukrainian uh, philosophers writers, historians. So I think it's always worth of applying critical thinking and, uh, you know, trying to get to the bottom of it, where these ideas were originally uh, surfaced. But of course, they play a huge role in how Russia pre presents its civilizational greatness. And it plays huge role within Russian culture to uh, establish the notion why they're so special and why they have the right to abuse others. Well, let's examine some of the mechanics, because what I love about the book, it, in each instance, it looks at the episode of Imperial Conquest, but it breaks down the mechanics of the process mm -hmm. from gaslighting to invasion to extermination and all the different techniques that are deployed there. So let's start with gaslighting as a technique. Um, We've seen this, obviously, in Ukraine take place both uh, 2014 after Maidan and, of course, during the run-up to and during the course of the full-scale war. This is the idea of stoking 
division or finding division wherever it exists and then really trying to sort of pour mm -hmm. petrol on those flames. What are some good examples of this mechanic at work and how does it function? I'm glad that uh, you pointed out because once again, I um, remind people that this guidebook is, you know, it's it has its own name 101. So it's only an entry point. And I myself, I'm not uh, an intellectual, I'm not a researcher, not an academic. So I can I cannot sometimes provide all the answers. Um, about Russian colonialism, how it operates. That's why I always reference people who are much smarter on it, who come from the region, who have really good record of studying um, this phenomena. But within this book, we specifically look at very tight period of the last century, and we show only invasions of the sovereign nations, not every uh, abuse that Russia did to indigenous people on the continent. And all the time within this formula of gaslighting, manipulating, and um, exterminating, gaslighting plays an important role, but it takes different forms. Like, for example, let's go back to Iran. Um, when the Russians tried to take over Iran twice in the, during the span of the last century, every time they would play on internal divisions and specifically divisions uh, within the ethnic national lines. So for example, once they invaded Iran, they tried to establish uh, these uh, people's republics of uh, in uh, of Kurd people and Azerbaijani people. Now, it, it's, it's not to say that these uh, national strivings are not relevant and not valid, and these people should be discarded and their uh, fight for freedom should be discarded. So it's definitely there. And for Kurdish people, this fight is continuing to this day. However, Russia masterfully used these uh, divisions and within the Iran to start chopping off parts of Iran that, of course, would fall under direct Russian influence right away. I mean, isn't it very um, similar to what we also seen since 2014 in Ukraine, where uh, Russia tried to present the outright occupation of Ukrainian lands as protecting, well, in Ukrainian case, non-existing uh, ethnic uh, uh, minorities because you know they were protecting just Russian-speaking Ukrainians, so to say. Um, so this playbook is as old as Russia itself. And of course, um, they masterfully use any divisions within the societies that they're attack to exploit that, to divide, conquer, and rule. And uh, this is what we need to pay attention extra when Russia, you know, plays an, uh, the, its eyes on, on some land they want to conquer. They will definitely go to the core of something that the most polarizing or make the even random issues or random disagreements within the society as extreme, as polarized as possible to exploit that. So that's the entry point. And of course, you know, the start of World War II is another extraordinary episode in a classical Russian technique. And that is the invasion to essentially protect the people you're invading. This, of course, is the pretext for Donbass as well. It seems on the surface to be absolutely absurd, because if you listen to the people who are being invaded, they do not want protection from this empire. And many of them know what's going to happen when that protection is provided. Um, they are not going to be better off. They're not going to be more secure. They're not going to be safer. And, and many of them will be, will be dead as well. Why, however, does it work? Because this one has been employed over and over and over again. Well, it makes total sense within the mindset of Russian imperialism. Um, I just read uh, recently, found this terrific work by Polish American scholar Edita Bajanowska on on very popular broad name of Leo Tolstoy, uh, and she wrote um, a fantastic essay uh, about Leo Tolstoy being a colonial landlord. So she paints a picture basically of Leo Tolstoy writing his famous novels that, uh, for better or for worse, lots of foreigners abroad know, while uh, making super profits of his colonial 
of farms in what is uh, now indigenous lands of Bashkort people uh, in Bashkor, uh, Bashkortostan. Bashkortostan. And basically, there is a moment there where, you know, he buys these uh, he buys these farms on the stolen indigenous lands and he tries to make business out of it. And th- he buys these lands on the uh, profits from his, uh, uh, I think it was uh, from Anna Karenina. Uh, no, it was War and Peace. And then he, you know, goes to this farmland uh, farmland to finish Anna Karenina. But the business is not going great because the environment the land is ruined the way it was uh, uh, taken care of by indigenous people uh, this knowledge is gone they import a lot of Russian uh, settler colonists who do not know how to treat local land who are not in touch with uh, nature so there is a horrible degradation uh, of lands happening in nature so he is very frustrated that things are not you know coming together but his frustration was also you know reflected in so many of his letters and works where he genuinely believed that he's doing good by taking the land from indigenous people and to introducing them to so-called civilization, to introducing them to modern ways of dealing with with agriculture, with our lands. And in his head, he was the good man who's trying to do good is to save these barbarian people from their ancient ways of dealing with uh, their own lands. And to this very date, you know, just because it started so long ago and has been shaped by all these Russian intellectuals, it's weaved into their culture and literature, still people to the day believe that what they're doing to places like Ukraine, erasing, turning to dust cities and, you know, so-called liberating people, this is all for good because they're crazy and they're irrational and they're uh, absolutely insane to resist this so-called civilization. And if you're crazy to resist civilization, you're probably insane. And there are only two options, either to cure you or put you down. And that's exactly what is happening, unfortunately, now in Ukraine. When we see if people in occupation presented with a choice, either you embrace a civilization, with, which means renouncing your identity, stop speaking your language, forgetting your history, becoming Russified, becoming so-called Russian, in, in embodying the imperial identity, you will live. If you don't do that, you're too crazy, and the good thing for you in their mind is to put you to death, uh, to stop your misery. This hasn't changed throughout centuries. And... There's an offshoot of that, isn't there, which is, I find one of the most sort of pernicious aspects of this, and this is the erasure of identity, where they succeed. Of course, one of the frustrating things, I think, for Russians is the propagandists, at least, have claimed over and over and over again that Ukrainian identity is not a real thing. The Ukrainian language is just a sort of offshoot of Russian. It's just a you know a colloquial version of a Russian rather than an independent language. The trouble is, when it becomes absolutely apparent that nobody wants to be Russian and no one fits with this mythology, then it's a fairly easy slide into what you were describing there, which is genocide. But this simple argument that you think you're different isn't enough perhaps to take that full leap into the genocidal behavior or to encourage everybody in their uh, you know, horde army to take that step. They have to introduce this idea that you're not just you're not just wrong. You're bad. You're a fascist. So, how does this label of fascism play within identity erasure and genocide in that whole process? Well, it's not only fascist. I mean, the the labels that they put on anyone who disagrees with imperial propaganda are just too numerous. Like even myself, I'd be on one day labeled, you know, Nazi. On the other day, I'd be labeled Jewish. On the other day, I'll be labeled gay, which you know I am, but still in a in a in 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 their views is derogatory for a person to be gay, of course. Um so this does not really mean anything except that 
the usage of this terminology is once again is really addressed to the outside audience. So to play on those division lines, if you're against fascism, you, you know, you will of course respond to someone being labeled fascist or Nazi. If you're against gay people, you'll be more sensitive towards someone, you know, labeled as uh, as a queer person and so on, so on. I think it's, it was a, a fantastic moment in the uh, Timothy Snyder's uh, lecture on Eastern Europe and Ukraine, which is available online. And he is uh, one of the most important historians of Eastern Europe out there. And he basically also breaks down this uh, um, historical propaganda line coming from Russia that every time they need to present um, the victim bad, they would just use whatever polarized label out there to kind of divide opinion drastically on that group to help the, the process of dehumanization better. And uh, um, this is just uh, how it's been used in or, you know, before Putin, during the Soviet era of the Russian Empire, during the imperial era, during Cyrus times, this is um, the same way how it's been done. Uh, lots of minorities within the empire would be vilified, labeled uh, as evil, labeled as dispensable, you know, starting from Jewish pogroms in early 20th century, instigated by Moscow and by Tsarist regime ending with deporting entire nations deemed as uh, dangerous, like it was with uh, Kremlin, Crimean Tatars, Chechens, Kalmyks. You know, just imagine importing entire nations overnight, you know, killing a half or more than half of them in the process, just because they were put the label of so-called traitors, for example. Um, so this is unfortunately a practice that it's stable. And I think the only reason why it's stable is because Russia has never faced any accountability for any of this. And not only people do not know much about it, there has been zero justice uh, done uh, regarding these atrocities. And that's an extraordinary blind spot, which I hope is starting to be rectified in that colonial studies and decolonization studies have uh, really uh, ignored Russia as an entity for study and the various practices that colonial mechanics were talking about. Do you get a sense that academia is starting to change? Policymakers are starting to reassess the view of Russia as an imperial entity and a particularly toxic one at that? Oh, don't get me even started on the academia part. Um, like, first of all, I think that uh, um, once again, I think there is a gap in public perception of regular people and also massive gaps in academia. And we've just put out a new video out there of Volehab that we did with the Ukrainian independent newsrooms with Ukraine about how Russia colonized Northern Asia and turned it into Russian Siberia. And basically, it's a simple one one minute Instagram reel that shows once again the um, uh, the playbook that Russia has used to steal indigenous lands. And we posted it out there and I see a lot of comments uh, from Americans or people elsewhere seeing, saying, wow, this is, sounds exactly the same like what they did with First Nations in Northern America or some other indigenous nations elsewhere. The playbook seems the same. Um, you know, wow, I've never thought that this you know, could happen somewhere else. And I think for me, I mean, once again, it was a testament of how good Russia is at covering up for the crimes, but also the massive testament of how badly Russia is, it has been researched and presented in intellectual circles, in academic circles, somewhere, say, in, the, in America or in the West. Um, we've just... Uh, published an episode of our audio show based on this book called Matryoshka of Lies. And one of the episodes looks into infiltration of Russian propaganda within the Western intellectual circles and how through decades and decades, Russia was successful at shaping up the image of Russia that Moscow wanted it to be. Um, that's why, for example, when in 2022, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine happened and genocide started, 
people were, you know, the most smartest people I know that were absolutely shocked despite spending decades of researching Russia. And they were shocked that this is happening and they couldn't explain it. And they were absolutely, you know, disoriented what is happening. And I was wondering if you guys spent decades of researching Russia, and this is surprising for you, despite that for a majority of Ukrainians or people living to Russia, I mean, the scale of it might be shocking, but what is happening at the bottom of it is not a surprise at all. And then it's not the first time that it's happening. Then probably you have huge problem with uh, your expertise of your competency. And luckily, in the last two years, unfortunately, with such a horrific price that the Ukrainians need to pay daily for this topic to be discussed and be in the center, but things are slowly changing uh, in many respects. First of all, indigenous voices are finally allowed to speak about the their own histories and their own lands without labeled bias or you know non-serious um the the topic of decolonization and looking at russia through lenses of imperialism and colonialism is finally becoming more mainstream um, people are not making fun of it anymore however on the same time it hasn't been just a couple of years it cannot undo decades of really huge uh, ideological infiltration that happened. And we have so many old school uh, academics who are not willing to change their ways. And maybe for, you know, like they say, well, you had your two years of talking about decolonization and your indigenous stories and all this lovely sweet, but, um, you know, let's let adults start talking again. Let's are still you know, start discussing about great powers and how Ukraine is just a pawn in this, you know, complex geopolitical games and whatnot, and, you know, how Russia is a great power and what uh, whatnot. I mean, it is happening because the infiltration is runs too deep. Um, there are lots of money at stake because there are entire departments run by people who are incompetent for decades, and it's very... Um, you know, very uncomfortable for them to admit that, and they can lose their jobs and respect, and uh, and then that's something that matters a lot in the academia circles. On the other hand, I meet some academics who have been in the field for decades, and they, you know, are very honest with me, saying like, "What the hell was happening? Why we weren't seeing it? Why it was so absolutely..." wielded through the lenses of Moscow, everything that we saw, the way we saw you, the way we thought about your history. So things are happening. They're not happening as fast as it would like. Um, and I think they will stop happening if we um, you know, stop putting pressure on decolonizing uh, Western intellectual circles as well, the way they see Russia. I, I hope there are some serious studies done in that distortion and looking at the processes of distortion, because it seems that Russia is also, as part of this colonization process, it is absolutely expert at manufacturing disinformation and at utilizing dehumanizing rhetoric. Um I have to say, I was less surprised at what happened, um, but then I haven't been, you know, entrenched in in academia and my studies of, uh, you know, the Russian Civil War and so on. Uh, way back when, as well as living in Russia in the nineties, suggested to me that this sort of thing could happen, and maybe it was only a matter of time. So it's 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 less less surprising. What has reengaged me in the topic, though, is the internet, digital media. And the fact that Russia seems to have found a medium that it is incredibly adept at. It takes these ancient colonizing practices and it seems to be able to adapt them for the new digital media space. And that is extremely dangerous. I mean, that's an entire 
different topic. As a journalist, of course, it's very close to me because I'm um, I'm concerned. No, I'm actually scared at what is happening within the social media platforms and the lack of accountability of how the content is served, how it's being rated, how it's been um, how it's been taken down, often based on which criteria, and uh, of course. This is a huge problem that needs to be addressed because on the other side of it, you, the audience, you don't see what you need to see. And you instead see lots of garbage or outright propaganda when, in fact, indigenous voices are people who seriously study it being censored, their content being taken down or deprioritized as too political. So these is a, this is the entire conversation, probably not part of the uh, conversation that we're having today, but it's out there. And I, as myself, as a content creator, struggle with it every day because my content, despite, you know, me going into all the depths of creativity, how to avoid uh, certain words and how to present facts in a creative matter so it doesn't trigger um, filters of political uh, content or, you know, on TikTok, my content is being labeled extremist, for example. Um, so I think that Russia is fantastically great at, uh, you know, manufacturing propaganda um, and also responding to the new age of um, social media and everything and make it creative. Uh, well, not creative as viral as possible, but it's not creative. As a journalist, when I look at the Russian propaganda, specifically on the area of imperialism and colonialism and Russia trying to once again whitewash its colonial crimes and presents itself as anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism champion, while, you know, still, for example, abusing uh, African nation as we speak, uh, Afri African nations as we speak. Mm. For me, there is a lack of originality there because when you see that Russian propaganda, it always lacks um, human touch or centering humanity in it. Like, it's always about, you know, really smart, cheeky ways to tr to twist debates and to use some talking points and to present itself it's like uh, as a as a quirky or smart or for example appeal to people who feel like they need to be more radical or more um contrarian for example but what it always lacks are just real raw human stories that feel natural and authentic because this is where Russian propaganda always fails. Because when you go to the bottom of it, when you amplify stories of people who are actually living these lives on these lands, who have these intimate experiences of what it is to live through colonialism, imperialism, you cannot, you know, just manufacture it. It's because the process of being colonized, living through colonial drama is so intimate and it's so authentic, that person who never had an experience with it will never be able to reproduce or to communicate it well. That's why, you know, when you see Russian propaganda videos, it's all about smart talking points or twisting the history or presenting lo illogical, logical fallacies and so on. When you see content and when you see stories for people who are trying to counter that or try to speak their truth, I think the most powerful stuff always comes from human stories. And that's why throughout the centuries, and I showed that in the book, Russian invaders are transfixed on erasing any evidence of personal stories and, uh, and uh, in-person testimonies from people who they abused and occupied. This is one of the first strategies when you invade the land. Just raise that, kill the people who are trying to speak their truth and erase any evidence that they existed and their works and their testimonies and so on and so on. Um, I'm just uh, maybe add a quick story. Um, we've just uh, talked with um, a very prominent Kazakh uh, scholar and researcher of Russian colonialism. Uh, Dr. Diana Kudaybergen, and she told me absolutely amazing story and horrifying that, you know, she did study, uh, did research in archives in, in Oxford, for example, 
And uh, she was absolutely shocked that she couldn't find enough resources in Kazakh language about Kazakhstan. The majority of it was in Russian. And within so-called Russian collection, would could make like their entire archives. So she said she thought, okay, I'll go to Kazakhstan and you know work in Kazakh archives. Um, and she was studying the period of Russian colonization in early 20th century. And when she started reading through uh, transcripts in Kazakh archives in Kazakhstan, she found out that you know the transcript can go in Russian and then it stops and there are like hours or minutes missing just because it says the conversation went uh, continued in Kazakh. And she says that this is one of the eye-opening moments to once again to highlight how much of indigenous knowledge in indigenous languages were very specifically erased or not even recorded, just because in Russia they thought that, well, it's a, it's a dangerous thing to do. Every time a person speaks in their own language, they probably will speak some truth that we don't want the rest of the world to hear. And it creates that sense of difference. Well, the last question here is, again, I get the impression from your book, and I think this is a very powerful one, one of the, the Russian expansionism and the desire to control and influence is, is never-ending. There may be periods where they're, you know, it's it's weak and the center is weak, um, but it always returns to a kind of colonial statism that will seek to reassert that process. But it's not a binary between either invading or not invading. There's a sort of gray zone of multiple techniques um, prior to the need for full-scale invasion. And actually, if you can control a country almost like a puppet, you don't need to do this step. Um, so infiltration, state capture, the corruption of institutions, uh, spreading sort of harmful narratives. If these don't work, then there are things like assassination, uh, you know, infiltration of, of moneyed interests, co-option of various uh, classes and people. Um, and of course, as we're now seeing in parts of Europe, sabotage as well. Yeah, absolutely. You look at the examples of Belarus, where now, unfortunately, Sakharov in Georgia, where they fund and they support the regimes that basically, um, you know, formally allow them not to do full-scale occupation, but these countries turn into full-fledged colonies where no independent decision making happening at all. Um, and uh, it has been the case for throughout the history as well. I think. Um, I think during the book shows, people often uh, come and, you know, say, well, I read this guidebook and it made me so depressed and sad because I feel like I now realize how long it has been happening, how long this empire stands and how many uh, crimes have been committed, how many people, how millions of people were murdered. And now, only now, we're starting realizing it and it makes me sad and depressed. But I... In these moments, I point out to the people that I specifically included a couple of chapters, not a couple, but plenty of chapters, to, to highlight where the resistance of people, genuine resistance against the invaders worked for the better, and they were able to kick the empire out. It happened in places like Lithuania and in even at some points in Ukraine. And uh, many other people, uh, many other lands. Moreover, in each and every of those examples, there was resistance. People all the time resisted. And in some of the cases, like for example, in Afghanistan or in other places, even with all the in Finland, for example, with all the military might, the empire couldn't break the spirit of freedom of independence people, and they had to go back home. So it did happen on many occasions. It should be an inspiration story for many people who feel like, you know, overwhelmed that this could not be, um, could not be done or the empire cannot, you know, crack. Um, I just remember, you know, a powerful speech that, uh, uh, once again, Professor Snyder um, gave and he warned that part of the imperial propaganda is to convince the rest of the people that the empires are forever. This is not what the history teaches. 
Thus, the empires always collapse and they always fall. It's like, you know, the merge for <laughs> from our book that says the empire will fall. And uh, it's a byline for the book. And this is just a, 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 his, a historic fact. And this will happen with this empire as well. But for the way for it to start falling and start cracking, of course, Ukraine must win. And that's why, you know, the, the supporting Ukraine in this regard is the most powerful anti colonial solidarity act that you can possibly do these days but there also also must be knowledge to ensure that there is justice and accountability for all those crimes done because if there is no justice the cycle will continue and in that re regard um just start seeing russia as an empire you know people constantly you know curious why you know russia is such a troublemaker why they need to invade and you know oppress and colonize neighbors just because this is how empires work. If you're an empire, expansion is your vital function. If you do not expand, you, you cannot sustain the empire. You cannot sustain the myth of greatness. And once we see Russia for what it is, a colonial empire, I think it would be much easier for everyone to see the future without it and also to make informed steps towards uh, ensuring that this happens. Yes, see it as a as almost a Ponzi scheme. If it's not expanding, it's collapsing, and, and and that that's a mechanic it has to maintain, and that may be a way to beat it. I think ending on what is an extraordinarily positive note, um, I think is important, and uh, you know, imparting to people that they are not helpless, that they can have agency, they can affect change, and be part of. Uh, the resistance to the empire, but also part of the empire's eventual destruction. I mean, there are so many ways how this story affects everyone. Um, not only in point in terms of security, right? It's scary to see how all these autocracies, North Korea, Iran, China, Russia, band banging together to destroy democracies, to erase entire nations. This is a scary world to imagine that we might live in the future. But it also the aspects of, for example, environmental uh, aspects, because Russia is a fossil fuel empire um, that does massive damage to our environment as well. So, I mean, in many ways, these stories hit home closer than many people realize. And this fight hits more personal everyone who can just be open-minded and see what is the story behind it, what are the powers behind it, what we're fighting against in this case. So I just want, you know, people to be more curious like yourself and talk to as many people as possible from the region, sharing their very unique personal experiences. And I think lots of people uh, will learn lots from it because at the bottom of it, we face quite similar challenges in our democracies, wherever you go. And <laughs> the evil side is quite similar wherever you meet it. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating once again. I really encourage people to uh, not just get the book, but see our previous conversation as well and look up your journalism activities on various media hubs. But for today, thank you so much. It was absolutely brilliant to speak to you again, Maxim, and good luck with all the incredible work that you're doing. Huge respect for you amplifying all our voices and the you know diversity of it. And thank you so much for for your work and for your project existing. This is uh, is a real honor, pleasure being here.